and there's a real steep hill that goes all the way down and back up past the high school. We don't have hills in Indiana. Right. I've always been real good, uh, uh, real good roller skating, and so I, my brother had chicken pox, and so I said, hey, can I borrow your, borrow your red roller blades? I'm going to rollerblade out in the road since we don't have anything else to do here in town. Right. And so I started, uh, I was going around, we were at the end of the kind of a cul-de-sac there, so we had a circle, you know, right around. I was, I was just trying to get some exercise and work off some boredom. And I started going down that hill a little bit and coming back up and going down and coming back up. And, and man, it was fun. I was enjoying that. Experiment with those Tennessee hills, amen. Well, one time I started going down a little bit, and, and I got going faster and faster, and I, 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 I recognized, suddenly it dawned on me, I have crossed the point of no return. <laughs> because I was going so fast, I'm, I'm talking about your shirt flapping and the breeze in your hair kind of fast. Yeah. Wow. And I had read a story in the newspaper, we didn't, we didn't get the newspaper when I was a kid, a kid. Amen. We, uh, my mom and dad tried to raise us for God, they didn't expose us to TV and all bunch of garbage and stuff, but we lit the wood stove with newspaper, and so I was reading the newspaper as I was lighting the wood stove. <laughs> And I was reading this story about this kid that got pulled over in Chicago for going 160 mile an hour on his rollerblades. I don't know what kind of rollerblades he had, but they weren't the same as ours. <laughs> I got going faster and faster and faster, and I thought, I, I, I thought, man, there was a side road there. I thought, man, if I could make the side road. Ah. And I was, Man, I'm, I'm talking about my knees started shaking, and pretty soon I couldn't control it. Those, I don't know what kind of bearings, they must have been Chinese bearings in those roller skates. Because, man, they started doing like this, and I couldn't stop it. And my legs are going in and out, and I thought, maybe I can make the road. Well, a few feet later, I thought, maybe I can make the ditch. <laughs> and I was only about halfway down the hill, and I was holding on to my knees. Like I said, I'd been roller skating. It wasn't like I was a, a, a newbie, but, man. I just couldn't handle it, and the skates weren't built for it. And my legs went out from under me, and I flipped. The uh, first thing I did was I fell down, hit my knees on the pavement. I must have been going probably not as fast as it felt, but it felt like I was approaching a world record. <laughs> <laughs> and I slid down the road on my knees and then flipped over onto my back and rubbed the floor out of my back. I'm talking about big old patches out of my skin. And uh, finally, I got stopped. And that was my favorite part of the whole thing. There was a lady sitting on the porch there. She said, are you okay? Why would somebody ask the question like that when they just saw somebody go by at the speed of light and fall on a grinding wheel? I said, of course, I'm tough, you know, I'm 21. I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. And I'm trying to get loose from the roller blades so I can stand up. And I walk back with my soft feet, holes in my shirt, holes in my pants, blood running down. I'm talking about the point of no return. You ever felt like we're nearing the point of no return? Yeah. Yeah. Seems like we're going down so fast we can't turn around. Help us, yes, sir. Help us. <clears throat> I get to thinking about that, and when I read this passage, here's a young man with regrets for having not listened to the instruction that was freely dispensed to him when he was younger. What are the people going to say that are alive now when they have regrets? Are they going to say, man, I wish I'd have listened? Or are they going to say, I wish somebody had told me? Mm -hmm. well. Do you know what I've learned in the past uh, many years of pastoring? I learned a simple thing, and that is that in some respects, the church in our generation has had to assume responsibilities that perhaps in some previous generation was not necessary. Like, for example, we sometimes have moms and dads that didn't have a mom and a dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. Yeah. We have grandparents 
that didn't get to see what it was like to have a grandma put a spread out in front of the family and pop all serve as they passed their plates around and bowed their head over the meal. They didn't stay with their grandparents and hear from the other room as Pop was up at 4.30 in the morning and Grandma's reading some Bible to him while he's getting ready to go to work. Come on. Listen, you know as well as I do that it's a rare thing to find a good, solid, fundamental, Bible-believing church of any variety. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. So what are they going to say? I think that instead of saying, I wish I had listened, a whole lot of people are going to be say, saying, why didn't somebody tell me? Yeah. yeah, that's good preaching, brother. Yeah. We've got to look at some verses tonight. I, I hope that you are up to looking at some Bible. Look at Amos, the book of Amos. And in the book of Amos, look at chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Yeah. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Oh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that we're there in every respect. Yeah. But there is so much confusion yes. introduced into religious philosophy yes. and thinking yes. that even sometimes the people that sit week after week in a Bible-believing church yes. have outside of that church heaped to themselves teachers having itching ears. Come on. And they're searching on the internet and on the TV yes. and on the radio and in books and in CDs for something that will tickle their fancy because they are looking for something that is new. Yeah. Something that sparks curiosity or, or satisfaction in their intellect and they're not looking for God like they were. I guarantee you that although it may not be that there's a famine yet of hearing the Word of God, I don't know if there is or whether there's not. I don't know where that scale begins and ends. But I guarantee you this one thing, we're headed that way. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Here's what it says. It says, they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Wow. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you some principles. Of transmission. See, the question is, how can we get the knowledge and experience of God and what He has told us and pass it from one generation to the next? Is that not the question? Right. So here's the principles of transmission. I'm going to read most of these verses to you because we're going to use our Bible a lot here toward the end. In Psalm chapter 78, it says, We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For He established a testimony in Jacob. And appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known unto their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. Right. Come on. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. I want my children to serve God better than I do. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. Better than their grandparents did. Better than their great-grandparents did. Yes. But in this verse, it says we shall tell them to their children. Well, whose children? 
There is in a sense a responsibility that we as families, both parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and so on, as well as churches, to pass along what God has done in each generation, as well as what He has said. Listen, we need, we need some stories. I love Bible stories, but I want to hear some of your yes. stories. Yeah, I will never forget being a 12-year-old young man sitting uh, on the front uh, pew up in front of the church. Testimony time comes around and there was a couple of people that from time to time would tell a story about a revival where they had gone to this small country church and it was a 20 below zero and snowing and all this stuff and only a handful of people showed up but God was there and helped them and I remember thinking as a 12 year old boy why do you keep telling us these stories and not showing us how yeah yeah bro Psalm 102, 18, this shall be written for the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Psalm 145, verse 4, one generation shall praise thy works to another and declare thy mighty acts. Yes, sir. Somehow, we have gotten derailed a little bit. Yes, sir. Because we have been willing to transmit the principles of the Word of God and the applications that we have drawn from them and have required obedience generation after generation and yet do we not see that we're losing this fight on some front? Right. Right. And listen, I'm not here to try to give some great answers tonight. We're going to look at some passages of what God can I'm uh, not necessarily what we can do, but how God works in the lives of church folks and parents and grandparents to help us out. But what I'm saying is, the Bible says that we shall declare His mighty acts. Let me tell you something about His mighty acts. Some of them are in the pages of this book. Yeah. Yeah. But I hope Come on, that bro. some of them are in the pages of your book. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. It's needed. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodst before the Lord thy God in Horeb. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me yeah. all the days they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. That's the principle of transmission. Older folks, tell the younger folks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. sir. Listen, Amen, preacher. I want the older folks in my church to tell their story to the younger folks. Amen. Yes. yes. Amen. I pray to God that the Lord would not only anoint the preaching from the pulpit, but that He would anoint the testimony in the pews. Amen, preacher. Because we have lost yes. a sense of of the supernatural presence and activity of God in everyday life. Yeah. Yes, sir, we have. And we have somehow set it apart in some kind of glass dome or mental museum where it's things that happened back then, but not so much now. Come on, Come on. Right. help us. Yeah. I have lots of verses. There's no end to these verses. I mean, you can just read them and read them. It says, therefore, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, shall you lay up these, my words, in your heart and soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand 
that they may be as prominent between your eyes, and ye shall teach them your children. Speaking yeah. of them, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, yeah. and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. God is the center of our home. Yeah, amen. I'm not, a, I, I want to be a great daddy. And I want to be a great pastor for people to transmit it from one generation to the next. And sometimes I don't do so well. But God said it's our responsibility to talk about it all the time. Well, yes, it is. Before I started pastoring, I had taught children for about 10 years. I traveled all over teaching kids. And what I learned was during that time, now, first of all, I learned that when it's somebody else's kid, it ain't the same as when they're your own. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> your own's a lot harder. <laughs> this brother got all his kids older than they really were. So time's not passing so fast. <laughs> Maybe it feels like it's dragging a little. I don't know. <laughs> Listen, I, there's difficulty, right? Doesn't take the joy out of it. Not saying that. Right. But, but what I noticed was as I would be in charge of other teachers and everything, the teachers that were the most, uh, the most successful and the most respected were the ones that belonged to the kids. So the kids would come into the church and there the teacher would be at the door. And the teacher didn't say, she, she didn't say, she didn't say, how are y'all tonight? No, no, no. She got right down there and she said, hey, how are you? 